Hi, um, welcome today to today's webinar. I am Carla Jenkins, and I'm the Calcaf Range Management Specialist for the Panhandle for the University of Nebraska, and I'm located in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And um, the topic I was asked to cover today was using byproducts and crop residues to maintain beef cows in confinement. And maybe a year ago, you would have been wondering, well, why would I want to maintain beef cows in confinement? But today, it's pretty obvious that a large percentage of the area where we have our beef cows is in a drought of either extreme to moderate proportions, and it's pretty much moving north, and so we're likely to see these drier conditions uh, for some time, and it's causing us to have some um, availability of grass issues. And we know that in our area, chronic drought conditions are a problem. Um, most of the rangelands where our beef cows reside from time to time undergo these um, drought conditions that reduce the availability of grass. But also, as commodity prices increase, there's going to be more acreage that might have been in some type of forage production that probably moved to crop production and reducing the availability of forage as well. And then always urbanization tends to encroach on our rangelands and cause us to have less and less. So we needed to begin thinking about where else we could raise cows and maintain cows to provide the beef for our nation and several others. So as we began to look at feeding cows in confinement, some of the questions that came up were, you know, how are they going to perform and how would we go about doing this? And so the first thing I want to show you is some studies that we've done at the University of Nebraska looking at maintaining cows in confinement to show you how it worked. And then we'll go into some logistics of how it might work for producers. But the first study was a study that Rick Rasby's group did in Mead, and they had non-pregnant, non-lactating cows, and they fed them on a dry matter basis, 41%, 59% ratio of bunkered distiller's grains to corn stalks which would have been about 1.3% of body weight for those cows, or they limit fed that same ratio of um, solubles to corn stalks, again, at 1.3% of their body weight, and compared that to ad libitum, which is just letting the cows decide how much they'll eat, of a 43% brome grass, 34% corn stalks, 23% alfalfa haylage diet. Now, if you want more information on this study, can actually find this in the 2009 um, beef report on page 11, but this is a table showing the results of that study. So initial body weight of those cows was similar across the three treatments, and final body weight was similar between the ad libitum fed control cows and the limit fed corn distillers, uh, corn stock fed cows, but was higher for those limit fed um, wet distillers grains and corn stalks mixed together. So the uh, body condition score of those cows was similar um, at the beginning and the end, and the cows did all pick up just a little bit of condition score. There was a tendency for the body weight change to be greater for those that were limit fed the um, byproducts and residues, and that was also true for average daily gain. Dry matter intake, of course, was substantially different because these two treatments with the residues and the byproducts were limit fed, and this is how much the cows ate of the other diet when they were allowed to eat whatever they wanted. So clearly, um, those cows could be limit fed, they could be fed leftovers, so to speak, um, and maintain very good condition. Now this is a study that we did out here in Scott's Bluff at our feedlot, and we used late gestation cows. They were not heifers. They'd had calves before, and we didn't have an ad libitum treatment. We limit fed ground alfalfa at 1.8% of their body weight. So these were about 1,100 pound cows, and they got 20 pounds of dry matter from the alfalfa or they were limit fed a ratio of, uh, on a dry matter basis, 30 
to 70 wet distillers grains to wheat straw. And this was fed at 18.3 pounds of dry matter. So this was 1.7% of their body weight. And we added 3 tenths of a pound of limestone to the diet um, because we wanted to add a little calcium since they were um, fed a diet that's fairly high in phosphorus. So limestone's cheap. It was easy to throw that in. And we were targeting um, 11 megacals per day, which is what the NRC would recommend for these cows during late gestation. That would be the energy level that they would need. And so in that study, we found that we started out with the initial body weight being the same for the two treatments. Initial body condition was the same. And their final body weight was the same and their final body condition score was the same, and they both treatments improved the body condition score a little bit during this limit feeding period. And they had a significant change in, in uh, the pounds of body weight, which the cows fed the residue and byproduct diet actually gained more weight. This is not a function of gut fill because the cows were Limit fed the alfalfa diet five days before the trial started and weighed for two days, and those weights averaged. And then again, at the end of the trial, the same thing was done. So um, it's a real number. Um, and calf birth weight was not different for those cows once they did go ahead and um, give birth. So basically, either way, we limit fed the hay, we limit fed the distillers, grains, and residue, and um, the cows maintained very acceptable body weight and, um, and continue to put on a little body condition, which was good. Um, and then we did a, another experiment where we again looked at late gestation cows. Um, both of these trials were over 70 days, between 70 and 80 days that we fed them during late, uh, late gestation. And again, they were limit-fed limit ground alfalfa. This time, we reduced it a little more. We thought that the alfalfa we were feeding was a better quality than it was. So we reduced that down to 1.6% of the body weight, and then um, fed the 30, 70 distillers and wheat straw diet at 18.7 pounds, or 1.7% of their body weight. And we added a third treatment, because we are in this uh, valley where our sugar beets are grown that we did a 40-60 a ration of byproducts and distiller or, or um, and residues, but it was 20% wet distillers, 20% beet pulp, and 60% wheat straw, again, dry matter basis, and fed them 18.3 pounds of dry matter, and again, we were targeting the 11 megacals per day. And in this study, um, they started out weighing the same. They started out with similar initial um, body condition score. But because we had overestimated the quality of the alfalfa and it wasn't quite as good as we thought it was, those cows that were on the limit fed hay diet did not have as high a final weight as the cows that were fed the residues and, and uh, byproducts diet. And final body condition score was also less for those on the limit fed hay as compared to the other two treatments. And they didn't have as high a change in body weight during that time frame. Um, but interestingly enough, limiting the alfalfa to that 17 pounds and it not being the quality that we thought, over that 77 day period, they still less, lost less than half a condition score. So it tells you you can limit cows a little more than they might want you to think they could be limited and still uh, maintain weight fairly well. These cows were also limited, but um, not quite as much, and um, clearly not as much from an energy standpoint because they pretty much maintained body condition um, during those winter months. So the other question that we get a lot of times is, well, will they eat the uh, byproducts and residue diet very well? And this is a picture of some cows um, with wheat straw and wet distillers all over their noses. And so looks to me like um, they liked it fairly well. And as evidence in the bunk, they did not leave um, feed in the bunk. And so I, I would say that they ate it just fine. Um, this picture is cows consuming 
consuming wet distillers grains and wheat straw, late gestation cows, um, being limit fed, to give you clearly from the background this pictures in Scott's Bluff, but this would give you an idea of the body condition um, that these cows were able to maintain on this um, byproduct and residue diet. And these cows are all averaging um, a little over a five. So um, they did do well on that. Um, these are the cows in the first year limit fed the alfalfa hay diet. And you can tell from their body conditions that they um, also maintained adequate body condition um, and did just fine even though they weren't getting to eat ad libitum. So our next question is, we've done this with um, non-pregnant, non-lactating cows. We've done this with late gestation cows that would have a higher requirement than the, the dry open cows. But um, what about a situation where um, the cows are going to have to be in confinement when their nutrient needs are high and, and major things in the cow production cycle are going on? So. Um, we're now conducting a study looking at calving and lactation in confinement. And I really don't have data to show you on this just yet because we have just started this project. But there are 42 bred cows um, that are calving now per location. And there's two locations. We have a group of cows in Scott's Bluff and we have a group of cows at Mead. The cows are limit fed. Um, at Mead, I believe they're fed the the condensed solubles and corn stalks. And at Scott's Bluff, they're being fed um, wet distillers and wheat straw. They will uh, calve in confinement and they will breed in confinement. And then the treatments are going to be early weaning versus um, traditional time frame of weaning. And we'll also compare um, how those calves perform to the traditional management at the Goodmanson Sand Hills Laboratory, where we have the research herd of cows out on range there. But to show you um, a picture of these cows, this, is, this picture was taken of um, cows that had not calved yet, um, although they're very close, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So they would have fed their limit-fed diet at 9.30 or so. And at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, clearly the feed is all gone. They would have cleaned that up in a relatively short time after feeding. But they're very content. They're um, laying down in the back of the pen. When I pulled up there to take pictures, some of them stood up, but they're not rushing the bunk. And you can see from the condition score, or the condition that the cows are carrying, um, that they're, they're between a five and a six. So they're um, certainly not, not hurting for condition to be uh, being maintained at this stage of their um, pregnancy on the limit fed diet. Um, this is a picture of some of the calves that have been born to this confinement system. The calves have all been healthy. We've not pulled calves. We've not had illnesses with the calves so far. Um, and then this is backing off of those calves a little bit and their mamas so that you can see now that the cow is in lactation, her requirement has gone up. She's still being limit fed. Now, we did um, up the amount of feed because her requirement went up, and I'll show you that in a minute. But if you look at um, the condition of these cows, you can see that they're still, they're not dropping condition. And that would be important because we want those cows to be um, in good condition going into breeding. Um, we don't want them in a declining plane of body condition when they go into breeding. Um, this is a picture the next morning at 9.30, and this is the cows that all came up to the bunk to be fed. They are all up there eating, um, but they're not pushing and shoving each other out of the way, so that's not really an issue there. This is a picture of the wheat straw and distiller's diet, so on a dry basis, and you have to convert this to an as-is basis, but on a dry basis, this is the 30, 70 um, wet distiller's straw diet. Um, that's fed mixed fresh um, and fed to them every day. And um, so not green, um, but, they, but they're certainly eating it. Um, so there are some considerations for doing this in confinement that uh, maybe are a little different than when we're feeding um, hay out in the pasture or in our um, um, 
winter feed ground. The cows need to have plenty of bunk space. There needs to be a minimum of two foot of bunk space per cow when they're limit fed. Um, I said earlier that we added some limestone for calcium. 18 pounds of limestone for a ton of feed and we'll get that uh, calcium phosphorus ratio where you want it. Remensin can be added up to 200 milligrams per head per day and since you're mixing feed and feeding every day anyway, that's a good time to do that or it's, it's good to go ahead and do that. That will probably cost producers between two and three cents a day. Um, research where, cat, where cows are fed um, as much as they want to eat, Remensen has decreased the amount of feed that they eat by about 7%. Wouldn't do that here per se because they're already limited and we're trying to feed them to maintain so there may not be any way to calculate the weight gain associated with that. But they're certainly going to be more efficient at using the feed that you are giving them. Um, and so it is probably a worthwhile investment. Um, I don't expect anyone who's doing this to have problems with sulfur or fat at the 30% um, distiller's level. But you should always um, take samples and send them into a commercial lab when you get loads just to know what they are and see if they're a little on the high side and if there's any management things you need to do because of that. We've used grind sizes from three to seven inches, depending on the roughage source. Um, so that's something to consider when using um, residues. On the other hand, at the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory, um, and they don't have a lot of this equipment that you would have in a closer to a feedlot, wheat straw in the wet distillers has been mixed successfully in a vertical mixer too. So. Um, sometimes you have to get a little creative, but you can do these things um, with limited equipment. This is a picture that Rick Rasby sent me from the eastern side of the state. So in a situation where a producer didn't have a backgrounding lot that they could put the cattle in or they didn't, weren't close to a feedlot and didn't have those facilities, um, you can make a bunk, so to speak, by um, putting it in the fence line so then the truck can come along this side and put the feed in and then there's a um, hot fence that runs here to keep the cattle from jumping out of the bunk but then this part of the fence has been taken out and they can reach in there and eat. So that's another way that um, feed could be supplied. However, I want to caution you um, some things to consider when you're confinement feeding outside the feedlot. So you're going to have them on a limited area but We've done some work with trying to replace forage um, on the pasture with feeding these mixtures of residues and byproducts. And we can't get a one-to-one -one ratio of replacement, so they're still going to eat some forage that's out there in the pasture, even if you're feeding. Plus, you're limiting them, so they're not full, and if they have that option, they are going to go great. So um, your pastures could continue to suffer overgrazing. So it's best if you're going to have to do that in a, in a pasture type setting to use a winter feed ground that's an area that you've already decided to sacrifice. You're not expecting to have good grass there or on some crop ground if you're in an area where you are integrating crops and livestock or a pivot corner or somewhere that um, you, you know you're going to sacrifice some ground for this because um, otherwise you could uh, do some damage to a pasture that you would like to preserve. And then I wanted to visit with you a little bit about um, different mixture options. And so there's some reasons that you might want to vary um, the 3070 to something else. Uh, price and availability of commodities. Depending on what part of the state you're in, certain commodities are available in certain quantities and certain times of year. Um, Palatability of the mixture, depending on what you're using, you may want to up the distiller's grains in it to make it a little more palatable. Storage of the mixture becomes an issue if you need to store it. And then the changing nutrient needs of the cow, if she's going to be in confinement through a large part of her production cycle, obviously her needs are going to change as you go. So this is an example of some mixture options for confined cows that you can use. And I use the wet distiller's grains and straw as a, an example. And I use 
if you look in the NRC, these 1,100 pound cows are needing about 14 mega cows a day if they're in lactation and closer to 11 if they're in late gestation. So um, you could mix this at a 30-70 ratio and 23 pounds of dry matter. Um, so you have to convert that to as is if you're actually feeding it. Um, would meet her needs during lactation as, and it would only take 19 pounds of that mixture during gestation. If you increase the amount of distiller's grains in the ratio, you increase the energy that's uh, in that diet and therefore to maintain weight, the amount you would need to feed would decrease. Okay, You can do a 50-50 and this is a really nice mixture if you're having to mix it and store it because the water content in that makes that um, that's a much better level for packing and storing. But when you get down here to 14 pounds of dry matter in gestation, that's pretty limiting on a dry matter basis, and the cows may be somewhat discontent on that. So um, you may want to mix this ratio for storage, but then you may want to add some residue to it to bring it back up to one of these levels when you feed or not. It just depends on how, you, um, how those cows react to that. One nice thing about the difference between these two ratios is from gestation to lactation, what you can change is the percentage of distiller's grains rather than the amount that you feed if that's a very available, cheaper resource for you. So the question also has come up before about mixing it fresh and feeding it every day versus mixing it all at once, storing it in an ag bag or a bunker silo or you know, however else, and um, Dr. Aaron Stalker did a webinar earlier that's archived on different storage methods for the stiller's grains. Um, but there was some question over, well, will they eat it very well if it hasn't um, had time to sit there and um, uh, the residue soak up that moisture from the distillers or the residue that you, or the byproduct that you're using and so we've actually done it both ways at the Panhandle Feedlot. The first year that we fed the gestating cows, we mixed the 3070 mix and we fed it stored. But the, what we ran into was that that's a kind of a dry mixture for storage. So I ended up having to add water to it and then storing it in an ag bag. So it added, quite honestly, a lot of labor to putting that together. So the next year, we tried feeding it fresh, and the cows ate it just as well. The difference is that you have somebody come in and grind the straw, and you make a straw bunker, a straw bale bunker, and put that straw in there. Uh, if you're in an area where the wind blows a lot, which it does in western Nebraska, you're going to have more loss of the wheat straw than we did from just mixing it and bagging it together the first year but it did save on, on labor. Um, we also, the second year, fed the 20 distillers, 20 beet pulp, and 60 wheat straw fresh, and um, got along with that fine as well. All feed was consumed any of the ways that, that we did that. This is a picture of the wheat straw and distillers that we mixed the first year and stored in an ag bag that we'd added the water to, and it stored fine, and that worked well. Um, because we were in a feedlot and we were mixing feed every day for feedlot cattle as well, I think for us it was easier to mix it because we also got loads of distiller's grains in maybe more frequently than a producer would. So there's things that as a producer you may need to consider. If uh, It may be that the availability of when those things are available and then how long it's going to take you to feed it, the, the losses of it sitting by itself may be such that even though it's a little more labor, um, you may prefer to store it one way or another as opposed to doing it fresh, but it's going to, everybody's situation may be different. Those are just things that you have to consider. So this is a table that came out of a NEB guide that um, Dr. Rasby and um, Dr. Stalker and Dr. Kloppenstein and I put together that you can find in the IANR pub um, 
deal, but it, it's talking about some of the things that we did with this um, residue and byproduct feeding. And here's a table that we put in it that shows um, some options, two opposite deals in a way. It's in this first side of the table, we have ground wheat straw at 70% um, and the wet distillers at 30. And that was my diet that I used for my cow. But then to store it, um, I added 68 gallons of water to get the dry matter of that down to 44, which um, it, you want it to be um, at least 50 uh, or lower to get good um, packing, to get the air out of it so you don't get spoilage. So that's the water we had to add to that. This on this side is an example of something that Dr. Rick Rasby did, whereas he flip-flopped these. Instead of 70% residue, he had 30% residue and 70% byproduct. So he didn't have to add water, and he got about the same dry matter content in his mixture as I did. Um, what he did then is, as he pulled this out to feed it, he added uh, more ground corn stalks to it so that the, the actual um, energy level of the diet was what he was targeting. But you could easily store either one of those doing that. Um, this is an example of a fresh diet using the beet pulp and the distiller's grains. So we had, um, here's the actual pounds um, per ton of the wheat straw, the distillers, and the sugar beet um, that we mixed that fresh. And my point, we did it fresh, they ate it fine, but my point in this is that the, the dry matter on that was low um, and uh, it could have been stored, I guess is my point. We fed it fresh, but with this amount of dry matter in this mixture, it could have been mixed when a producer was able to get that. Now, I realize sugar beet's not, um, sugar beet pulp is not available to everyone in the state, and at times it's limited to those in western Nebraska. You have to get the contracts early in the spring if you want to get it in the fall, and I know distillers grains can be that way too. Um, but this particular mixture could have been fed fresh or when these were available and you were able to get it, you could have stored it without having to add water. I guess another point I should make is that you could mix wheat straw and dried distillers grains. A lot of times in western Nebraska it's easier for cow-calf producers to get dried distillers grains. You could add water to that and it would um, keep them from separating out into the straw and distillers um, and, and work fairly well too. So if we're going to do a little bit of ration cost comparison, um, this is how I went about it. And this was a little bit hard for me because it seems like there's a lot of variability in commodity prices right now across the state. So if this doesn't fit your area, you're just going to have to plug in your own numbers. But for us in western Nebraska, I assumed if corn was six fifty a bushel, and, and for us getting distiller's grains, that distiller's grains is priced about, on average, 93% of the price of corn. And I want to put this on a dry matter basis because I want to take all the water out of it and to make comparisons. And I'm going to assume that corn is 89% dry matter. The price of um, the wet distiller's grains on a dry matter basis would be $240 a ton, and I'll show you how I got that. And you may need to add um, $10 a ton for trucking. And again, that's going to depend on where you are from plants and that kind of thing. And wheat straw in the panhandle this week is $85 a ton, including the trucking and grinding costs. For some of you east of here, it may not be that high. Um, but for us, that's what I had to use. So what I did was I took the price of the corn per bushel and um, put it on a pound basis, and then I took the water out of it, okay? And so I came up with this 13 cents uh, a pound. And then for the stillage grains, I'm going to multiply that by 93% uh, because that was going to be the value related to corn. So I came up with a price per pound for the wet distillage grains on a dry matter basis. And then I multiplied that by 2,000 to see what that was a ton. And then I added my trucking in. So I got that 252 for the, the silver screen. Um, 
And then if I want to go back to, now I've got my trucking cost and everything in here. So now what is that a pound with, with my trucking in there? Now I'm going to feed 19 pounds of dry matter and a third of that, 30% of that is going to be from this distiller's grain. Okay. And um, so I've got this many pounds. I've got 5.7 pounds out of this 19 is from distillers times that price that I figured out that was going to cost me. So that tells me for that one cow a day on a dry matter basis, that's what it's going to cost me to feed the distiller's grain. Okay, so I've got that for distillers. Now, I already had the trucking and grinding in the hay. Um, so basically, I, if, if out of 19 pounds, 70% of that is 13.3, so that's how much straw I'm feeding. So this would be my total cost per day for the cow for the straw. So my feed cost for limit feeding this uh, ration out here in the West would be $1.35 a day per cow for her feed plus some equipment cost for feeding. And that's pretty variable depending on the equipment that you have available to you. So you have to figure out what you feel like that costs you. Now I could have fed that cow 20 pounds. I could have limit fed alfalfa at 20 pounds, assuming I can get that. And out here right now, it's already at $185 a ton or so um, that I've heard. So that, doing those same calculations, would end up to be um, over $2 a cow per day for the feed cost, um, but might have less equipment costs associated with it. So you have to kind of make some decisions on um, how that really works into your operation, what that's actually going to cost you, depending on what you have to work with. And, what commodities you can get um, and how expensive they are in your area. Another option that you might have if you don't have the pasture to sacrifice or an area to do that, you don't have the feed stuff, you can't get them very well because of where you are. I realize um, there's places in the western part of the state that are pretty remote and so maybe you don't have some of those options available to you. Another thing for you to think about is putting them in a commercial feedlot. They may have empty pens and they may be willing to feed cows or pears. Yardage and feed charges vary, so you need to call some feedlots and say, you know, would you be willing to do this and what would it cost me if you did this? And, and uh, tell them, you know, I want to limit feed them, so I don't want them full feed. Here's what I know we can do with them. What would you charge me to do this? Um, and they'll charge different things for feed. They'll charge different yardage charges. So that's why you just need to see what, what they will do. And the yardage charge may depend on the labor required. If you're just feeding the cows, they may not charge near as much for the yardage as if you have to br they have to bring them in to the chute and they have to be AI'd and things like that. So how much the cows are handled, or if they have to calve them out there, whatever, uh, will probably impact this. And that's just something you need to visit with the commercial law about. They may have um, more access to byproducts and residues as well as corn and hay. If you attended any of the Ranching for Profitability series this last week, then you saw Dr. Rick Rasby show you different combinations of diets and one of them that he had was a pretty decent corn and hay diet, but it can be limit fed to cows as well. And, and that might work in a, in a feedlot because they would have that. They typically have plenty of bunks and they certainly have the equipment to mix the rations. So depending on what you have available, they might be a better option for you. Um, so let's say you don't want to take them all the way to a feedlot somewhere and you really don't have confinement, much confinement option yourself. You don't have the equipment for it anyway. Maybe you have the pen, but you don't really have the equipment for it. Um, can you do something like this without having to actually mix the diet? And the answer is yes. If you are way up in Sand Hill somewhere and you don't have a lot of availability of some of these things, you can use low quality meadow hay. Let's say it's 50% TDN instead of lower like your residues would be. And you can get dried distiller's grains brought in there, um, but you can't really get wet. Then you could um, feed the diet that I show here I changed the ratios just a little bit because you've got a, um, a little more um, hay that you could use because it's a little better quality. 
and you are probably bringing in your distillage grains quite a ways, and so maybe you have more of this than you have of this, we can up this a little bit and we can limit feed those cattle. You can simply feed the distillage grains in a bunk and then uh, feed the hay on the ground. Um, the one thing I would say here is if you've got some really low quality meadow hay that you got out of somewhere that normally you can't even get to, I would have it tested and if it's closer to the 45 percent TD in that straw is, I would just go with the 70-30. And you could, um, again, limit them to 19 pounds or so if they're about a 1,100-pound cow. So this is the as-is percentage, is how much you would actually feed of these things, uh, accounting for the amount of dry matter that's in them. And that would work as well. That would allow you to limit feed with the resources that you might have. So I guess my conclusions for this would be that gestating and lactating cows can be maintained in confinement. We've shown that with research. Crop residues and byproducts make acceptable diets for confined cows. Confining cows may be a better alternative than liquidating a large portion of your herd. And that's why it's important that you go through some economics and see if there is an alternative um, for feeding them that would um, maybe prevent you from having to do that, if that's the better option. So I guess with that, um, I'll take questions. If there's some on the chat box, that's also my contact information. Lots of good information at beef.unl.edu. Um, and one of the things that's on there are these archived webinars, and this one will be added to that. So that will be on that. Um, website as well. And that's all I have. Carla, this is Betty. Right now I don't see any questions. Okay. But we'll wait just a minute. Maybe somebody will write one in.